All right, um, thank you for coming. Today we're, I'm going to talk about selenium, which has been my focus in the past years. Uh, even more so recently, since I also joined the Selenium project last year. So I'm going to give you some, I hope, very useful insights regarding what has been going on with the project in the past year and so. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the interesting features that have been released. Also, short disclaimer, this morning I wasn't aware, but luckily I read the press in the morning, and I realized we actually had a release yesterday. So, Selenium 4.10 was released a day ago, so wow, that's exciting. Uh, especially considering that in 2024, I think in October, the framework is going to be 20 years old. So, in 2004 was the first time the commit or the, the library was launched to the public. So, yeah, we're thinking about celebrating somehow. It's a, quite a milestone. But having said that, it's a 20-year-old, let's say, framework. However, I'm not going to say that it's old, because old would mean that nothing is going on with the project anymore, and that is not true. We keep releasing every year. We're trying to release every month, because we do have some things that we need to take care of. And I'm just going to show you next how you can actually check out uh, what is being released. So we do have several places where you can take a look. Uh, I'm going to start with the GitHub project. So we do have the Selenium HQ um, GitHub project where we publish the releases. And uh, for each release, you can see that you have available for downloading the corresponding assets. And we do support I think five different bindings, so five different programming languages, which is another great thing about this uh, framework. So we do have Java, .NET, uh, Ruby, Python, and uh, JavaScript. So for each of them, uh, you know, we, when we do a release, we are trying to release the same functionality on all of the programming languages for, or for all of the bindings. In some cases, it is not possible, obviously, because of some um, binding or programming language limitation, but generally when we are releasing something, we are trying to make it consistent across the, all of the available bindings. Also, we do have some very specific uh, bugs for each of these programming languages. So, for example, as I was looking at yesterday's change log, uh, there were some Python-specific stuff, for example. But as I said, this is the first place you can look to see what has been released. And uh, you can also check out our official uh, documentation page or our official homepage, which is selenium.dev. And there in the downloads section, you can see uh, what is the uh, currently, uh, currently released version. Well, this is an older screenshot, so this is where you can see the version. And then you can also read the change log to see more information about what is being released. Uh, Apart from that, uh, on the GitHub pages, we do have details and we do have the list of commits that have been going into the, the release, just so you get more information or the most information possible, so you get a clear understanding of what has been changed. As you can see on the right-hand side, there are like a few descriptions of, uh, you know, of the things going into the release, and on the left-hand side, you can see the, the actual commits you can, you can read through. Also, when it Whenever we are doing a release, we are publishing this information on the blog. So Selenium Dev slash blog is where we publish the blog. And we might also have some blog posts regarding some large functionality that we're releasing or something that's more interesting, let's say. Uh, so as I said, what's included in releases in general? Uh, the first thing, well, new features when we have this possibility. Now, we have been working, or well, the developers have been working on two major things in the past releases, which are the Selenium Manager and the Bidai Spec. And I'm going to go through those um, in the next slides. Uh, so th those are some of the new features, but we also have other ones, either more, you know, ma major functionality or some small additions to, addition, uh, to existing functionality. Uh, we also offer uh, Chrome DevTools support, and because we do that, uh, we need to release, like we need to kind of coordinate the releases of Selenium with the releases of Chrome so that we support the latest Chrome Dev protocols. We are also doing maintenance and cleanup because there is some code in the framework, some code that is old, unused, deprecated. 
So it's always a good idea to have you know, a clean working project. That is why you will see in each release that some code is going away because it hasn't been used previous, uh, or in a very long time. Or there was a case where some internal functionality was exposed and uh, the developers you know, wanted to remove it because yeah, that wasn't supposed to be used by testers. Obviously, we do have a lot of bug fixes, and um, yeah, what can you do to get a bug fixed faster? That, <clears throat> that would be the, the question. And I know that if you're using Selenium, you're, you are aware that basically this is a volunteer project. So we do have people, um, you know, allocating their own spare time to develop the, the framework going forward. But if you have a certain bug that is really annoying you, and you have the possibility to fix it, we invite you to commit, uh, you know, fix a bug, become a committer is one of the mottos of the framework. So if you think you can help out with anything, you can find us on Slack, or of course you can see on the Selenium uh, official page who is part of the project and you can reach out to those people. Now, before I'm moving into, you know, what's new in the framework, I know that most of you already are aware that Selenium 4 was released, I think, in 2021, in October or November. But my question to you is, who here is still using an older version of Selenium, which means a three-point something version? Only two people? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so that's, okay, that's good, that's good. Um, I... I did a poll on LinkedIn and Twitter a few months ago asking the same question. Who that, you know, is following my feeds is still using an older version? And I was shocked to see that around, I don't, yep, that around 30% of the people who responded were still using Selenium 3.py. So that was a long time ago when the, that uh, version was released. So if you are still using an older version, I encourage you to upgrade to the latest one because there's always new stuff coming. And because the change or the move from Selenium 3 to 4 isn't that complicated to do. There is a dedicated page uh, that tells you exactly what you need to change in your framework to get to the latest version. And those changes are just, you know, just to name a few, the fact that previously there was the so-called desired capabilities to, you know, to work with the browser, so to set certain browser properties when it would open. Now, we don't have desired capabilities anymore. We have options. So we have Chrome options, Firefox options, and so on. And that is what is replacing the previous desired capabilities. Uh, there were, as I said, some internal methods that were exposed, and those have been removed, removed as well. Uh, for web driver weights, the way you set the timeout period has changed from an int to a duration. So this is a different type of data to be used. And yeah, some browser legacy code was removed. So if you want to move from Selenium 3 to 4, some of the things uh, you know, can be automated, meaning if you have uh, a good um, IDE, a good code editor, it can just you know, replace uh, some of this code automatically everywhere you are using it in a project, so that makes it much easier to switch to the latest version. But, you know, let's, let's go through some of the things that have been released recently, and these are just in random order. So, a few months back, there was a new Chrome version, um, I think it was 111 actually, where the developers of the Chrome browser have changed the way uh, they do headless, so headless mode. Previously, the headless browser from Chrome wasn't exactly headless, it was kind of a it, it, it was not really proper headless, let's say. And they've decided to, to change that and to offer the new headless mode. And previously in Selenium, in order to enter the headless mode with Chrome, I'm, by the way, I'm just showing Java code because I'm using Java, but as I said, this, this would reflect on other programming languages as well. Uh, in Java, we had a dedicated method that would say open uh, headless or set headless which was, I don't think my pointer is working. Yeah, it was this method here which said uh, set headless. And this was the only convenience method for any browser argument uh, that you could, you could set on your browser. 
So that was removed and from now on, in order to start Chrome headless with Selenium, you would have to just add another argument as you would with other arguments you might be using, like, you know, set where the download path for your files is or, you know, where your executable is found and so on, whatever browser properties you have. Now, similarly, you're just going to use the new way of uh, defining the headless mode, which is, uh, well, you can see it there. So headless equals new is the new headless mode you can use from Chrome. So this is a very simple and very basic way of uh, using the headless mode. And something else that has been introduced in the framework is um, native support for scrolling using the Actions API. So what do we have here? Uh, we have the option using, as I said, Actions, so after uh, initializing the Actions class, to scroll to a particular element. So you would define your web element that you want to scroll to, and you would just call this command to, you know, do the, to, to do the scroll in, in your test. You could also scroll by amount. So you could say, uh, I want to scroll to the left or to the right, upwards and downwards. You can do that with scroll by amount by passing in the values corresponding to, you know, the axes, right? So if you want to go up or down or uh, left or right. You also have the uh, option right now in the latest version to scroll from a particular element. So you can define an origin, as you can see in the first line of code. The origin is basically the point from where you want to start scrolling. And from there, you have the option to scroll, for example, to the left or to the right with an amount um, that you can express as pixels. You can also scroll relative from an element. So you can define the position from where to start scrolling, not exactly on an element as you would do before, but somewhere next to the element by again providing the location in pixels. So toward, towards the left, towards the right, and from there on to start doing your scrolling either way you want to do it. And the last option for scrolling is scrolling from the viewport. So uh, here we have an example where you are, so you are scrolling with 10 pixels by 10 pixels from the origin of the viewport, which is, you know, like the coordinate zero, zero, how it is defined in the viewport. You can scroll from there on to a, a certain uh, direction. And here, if, you're, if you want to scroll with an amount that is invalid, which doesn't belong to the um, viewport anymore, you're going to get uh, an exception. So you will see that you haven't used the scroll properly. Now another, let's say, uh, addition to existing functionality is being able to resize a window by using now the minimize method and the full screen method. Previously, we only had the option to maximize a window and to set a, a, pre, a a specified dimension for your screen. So you would have to say that I want a new window with a dimension, I don't know, 100 width and 200 height. Now you can both minimize and if you want you can enter full screen in your browser to allow for more content to be present when you're testing. Something that I think has been requested for a while was to be able to open a new window uh, by using the switch to command. So, um, you know, previously you were able to open or to switch to a window which was open by some interaction in the test. For example, if you clicked on something and it opened a new window, you were able to switch to that new window. But what if for some reason you need to kind of, let's say, pause your testing and do something in a separate window, like log into some domain that gives you some information to use in your test. You can do that right now by using the driver.switch to new window uh, method, and you can open, as you specify uh, in the parameters, either a new window or a new tab. And based on that, you will get the new window and you will be also uh, directly switching to it. So you can directly start working with it and then you will close it just as you would close any other window with uh, driver close. Shadow DOM. Uh, does anybody here know what Shadow DOM is? Yeah, okay, one person. <laughs> All right, so Shadow DOM is basically 
a way of, let's say, encapsulating um, a part of a page into the, the rest of the page without the rest of the page knowing what's inside the Shadow DOM. So it's kind of like hiding content inside. From the outside, you cannot interact with elements directly uh, in the Shadow DOM. And from the inside, you cannot do the same with the outside. Uh, previously, there were some ways of interacting with what's inside the Shadow DOM by using some JavaScript code or by, you know, running some J uh, JavaScript executors. Now you have the option out of the box to, first of all, define who is the, um, let's say, the, the root uh, element or where the Shadow DOM starts in your document. That is the part here where you're defining the web element shadow host. So you need to provide a selector which says, okay, this is the, uh, the, where the uh, shadow DOM starts. And then using search context, you will get the shadow root, which is basically the, the shadow uh, DOM is like a tree which has a, a parent node. The shadow root is the parent node. And once you save it into the search context, using the search context, you can find elements inside the Shadow DOM, you can interact with them just as you would on a, any regular uh, chunk of HTML code. And uh, this is available for the latest uh, Chromium-based browsers. Chromium-based browsers are Chrome, Edge, I think, and Opera, if I'm not mistaken. So these are the ones for which this feature works. But yeah, I, I posted some links here for you to do more research and Obviously, I recommend you go through our documentation and the blog to read more about all of these, uh, all of these features. Previously, uh, we had the option to take a screenshot of you know, the, the visible viewport. So whatever was open in the browser, we would take a screenshot of that uh, entire portion. Now with the latest versions, we can actually screenshot an element if we want to. So just that element. We just need to define who the element is, and then we can use the element.getScreenshotAs method to take a screenshot of that element. And here I have two examples where I had uh, two drop downs. The one on the left hand side is a multiple selection drop down, and the one on the right hand side is just a plain regular drop down. And using the screenshot uh, as method directly on the drop downs, I was able to retrieve only the information that was in there, not the entire content of the page. So this can be useful in some test scenarios. But apart from this, and only if you're using Firefox driver, so not when you are using a web driver to interact with the browser, but a Firefox driver, only then can you actually take a full page screenshot. And what does that mean? It means that if your page is longer or, well, larger than the current viewport, this get full page screenshot method is going to stitch together the entire page and you will get the screenshot of everything that's on the page, which can be, again, pretty useful in some cases. Previously, you had the option to define web elements using CSS selectors, XPath, and so on. And sometimes that was a bit complicated and you just wanted to kind of identify an element which is somewhere next to an element you already know of. Maybe it's to the left-hand side, maybe it's to the right-hand right side, upwards or downwards. Um, now there's a way to do that, but this is screen size dependent. So uh, this is position-based, let's say. I, I put a link there uh, regarding how this is actually calculated. So let's say your screen or your page is loaded in maximized mode. Uh, you can use the methods available. However, if you're resizing the screen, your elements might, mo might move around, and what you initially saw on the page as being to the left of something might now be uh, downwards or upwards. So think about this when uh, you're using these uh, uh, relative locators. These relative locators do not work with the at find by annotation. So if you are, as me, someone who stores their element in page objects and defines them with the at find by annotation. This is not an approach you can use, unfortunately. But how does it work? Well, in my case, I have highlighted in green an element that I want to find another element close to. Um, I defined it uh, in this section where I say to left of. So I need to specify 
who is my reference point, where do I need to start, to start searching from, and I'm saying that I want to look to the left of, so to left of is the method that says, okay, to left of, and what am I looking for? I'm looking for a relative locator with a selector, and this is the selector that I provided here. So in my case, I'm looking for the link, which is to the left of this input, which is highlighted in green. And this is how I can do it. So here I just need to provide two selectors. The one of the element toward, I mean, from which I'm starting the search, and what is the selector of an element that I know I'm looking for. In my case, I'm just looking for a link, a basic link, right? The first link to the left of my input. And similarly to left of, we have to right of, above, and below. So as I said, you can look for elements up, down, to the left, to the right. There's also a method called near, for which I've seen that there was, uh, in this release from yesterday, there, was, there were some enhancements. So if this is something you're interested in, you can check it out and try it out to see if it does what you expect it to do in your testing. Selenium Manager. Um, how many of you are familiar with Selenium Manager or WebDriver Manager? I see a few hands. Okay. How many of you know about what the driver file is? If you're using Selenium. You have a driver file, right? So in order for your Selenium tests to actually interact with the browser, you need to download or you needed to download an intermediate executable file called a driver. The driver files are specific per browser. So you have a Chrome driver, you have a Gecko driver, which is a Firefox driver, you have Edge driver, you have, and so on and so on. And it's not as simple because then you also have these drivers for each of the browsers per each of the, brow uh, for, uh, each of the operating systems where you're testing. So previously, uh, you would have to manage all of these driver files to download those for the op operating systems you would run your tests on and for the browsers you were using and store them somewhere, hopefully in your project. And whenever a new browser would be launched, chances are you would also have to update the driver file because some of the driver versions were not compatible with the browser versions. Because of this, um, there was a guy, Bonnie Garcia, who some years ago created his own library for, for automatically managing your uh, driver files so that you wouldn't have to download the files and always change them when something uh, new appeared. Now recently, he's actually working inside the Selenium project and he has implemented a large chunk of the same functionality inside Selenium. So if you're using the latest Selenium version, you don't have to worry about the driver files anymore. You don't have to download them, you don't have to put them in your project. The library downloads the latest version compatible with the browser you are uh, starting into a cache somewhere in your system, so you won't exactly see the file laying around in a certain folder. And every time you run your tests, if there's a new driver file matching uh, your freshly updated browser, the driver file will be uh, downloaded for you and everything will work seamlessly. So you don't have to bother with the driver files at all. Except if you want to uh, use a particular driver file because you might have a situation where you have to hard code the browser to an older version. And so you need a particular driver version for that uh, older browser. Then you still need to set the, the location for the driver so that when you open the browser, Selenium knows about it and you have to still maintain those, those driver files. Baidai is a very large chunk that is currently being worked on. Uh, to keep it short, you know about Chrome DevTools, right? Uh, in Chrome DevTools, you have the option to emulate geolocation, you have the option to intercept network traffic or at least to read it, um, you know, read cookies, look at the console logs and so on. In Selenium, there are some commands available for you to interact with Chrome DevTools, but this is just Chrome. The vision is to have a unified um, model or a unified API where you can do the same interaction with all of the browser's dev tools. And for this, the BiDi spec has been created. So this is a W3C standard uh, specification, which the browser vendors are also implementing on their end. So this is a joint project between Selenium, 
which you know uh, we need to write code on our part in order to interact with the browser dev tools but also the vendors are working on that unified API so that you can seamlessly switch between the browsers when you want to do such things as read the console log or set a geolocation. For now, we have two, let's say, fully working um, modules from the DevTools or, or across the, the browsers that you can use. The browsing context for navigating and opening windows and reading such browser information and the log. So you can actually check out the log to see if there are any errors in there. But as I said, this is a very large chunk of work. And until this is finalized, you, you have still the option to work with the Chrome DevTool support, which is the CDP support. So by that slash CDP means this is the Chrome DevTool specific uh, functionality that you can use. Again, a lot of useful links and a lot of examples you can take a look at in order to understand you know, what I'm talking about and how you can use um, this information from the browser in your tests. Because the vision is for your tests not to just send information to the browser, but also to receive useful information from there and to read it and to you know, act accordingly to the information that uh, you receive. Uh, inside the project, there was also an HTTP client, uh, which currently is not maintained anymore. And because sometime in the future, Selenium wants to move to an, uh, a higher level of minimum supported Java, um, we need to use an HTTP client that can also use the same Java version. And unfortunately, the one currently in the project doesn't. So because of that, there was a separate um, library created by the developers of Selenium, which is the Selenium HTTP JDK client. Um, you can use this as a dependency in your project if you want in the future to, to interact with the HTTP client. Uh, it's actually used for uh, communication with the browser and for the grid, if you know about the grid. So some communication with the grid is happening through this HTTP client. Also using the latest HTTP client, this library that I mentioned, uh, helps to fix one of the issues which was uh, recently in Chrome. I think it was Chrome 111, where if you started your test in the morning, you would realize that Chrome had updated and nothing was uh, working anymore. It was something related to cores. There was another, uh, another fix you could have done. Um, you could have set a browser argument to be able to start Chrome um, from then on. Or you could uh, download this client, which again, the project recommends to use because in the future we will actually need it when we upgrade to a hopefully large, my, uh, major version like maybe Selenium 5. There's also the option to do uh, virtual authentication. So if you have that passwordless uh, public key authentication in your project, like if you would need a token that you would have to generate in order to do your login, now you have the option, the option to do that. I just left, left some uh, slides here because uh, there is a very good test class uh, in the project which explains exactly how to set up your authenticator, how to initialize it, and how to use it in order to do the authentication in your tests. So check that out. It's quite interesting. Uh, another small thing, let's say, that was released, I think, in 4.9, was that an invalid, sele uh, invalid selector exception now extends WebDriver exception. Why is this important? You know, um, many of us use WebDriver weights, and if by mistake you were writing an invalid selector and you would use it with a weight, uh, you would have to wait until the weight has you know, finished, uh, until the timeout has elapsed in order for you to see an error that says, hey, invalid selector. So then somebody in the community said, I want to change that, I want to fix it, and I want to fail instantly in case my selector is invalid. And so, you know, he decided to, to make a, a fix for it, and now, as I said, if your selector is invalid, for example, you forgot the square parenthesis where you were supposed to, to add it into your selector, you will know that immediately. Small fix, but, you know, it can be useful to save, save quite a lot of time. Uh, grid. So Selenium Grid, you know, the option to run multiple tests on multiple browsers at the same time, which are being uh, spawned by the grid. 
starting with Selenium 4, the grid was updated, so it was actually rewritten. The whole architecture was changed from what was previously in there, which uh, allowed for various run modes like standalone, hub distributed, for better reliability, for much more functionality, and also observability was introduced so that you have more information regarding what is going on when the tests are running in the grid. Because previously, you know, your tests were running somewhere on some node and you wouldn't have any, you weren't aware of the communication going on between the nodes and so on. So this is what happened, uh, observability was introduced. Uh, it's using the um, telemetry, there, there's a library telemetry, I'm, I don't know the entire name right now, but yeah. You, can, you, you get the picture. So you get more information regarding the, the test run if you're running on grid. And also regarding grid, now you have the option to run your tests on dev channel or beta channel uh, browsers. So if you want to test that your current product still will work well when a certain Chrome browser, for example, will be launched, you have the option to run your tests using the beta or the... Um, uh, the other, which one did I say? Beta and, help me out. Yes. So you can still use, or you can just uh, perform a, a setup in your uh, grid, and then you can run your tests and check whether everything is going fine. And if there's certain functionality that you're missing, like, you know, embedded weights, or I don't know, you want some test runners, or, you know, something more complex than what uh, the Selenium framework or library offers you, you have the option to use libraries from the ecosystem. There's quite a few libraries here, and I'm pretty sure you know at least two of them. So these offer some, let's say, out of the box functionality that otherwise you would have to build yourself. And Selenium, the project, supports these ecosystem libraries, and they do encourage people to use them because, you know, sometimes people ask developers to develop certain features in the Selenium library, and the developers say that it's a core library that you can build on top on whatever custom things you need. And because of that, some people did that. They built their custom code, and they just made it available for everyone to use as open source. So check that out. And yes, I have also launched something as a, let's say, pet project, but I think it's a very useful one. Maybe a few years ago I was here and I was talking about using weights in, uh, in your Selenium tests in order to have reliable Selenium tests. Uh, and now I've outsourced, like, or open sourced some of the methods I find useful. So these are weight-based methods for, for example, up to now, selecting from a drop-down, typing into a text, clicking on element, and so on, so that you have more reliability in your tests when you're doing these interactions. They also have some, some of them have uh, embedded checks, so you're also checking for your interaction to be successful. So yeah, uh, I recommend you go to my blog, imalittletester.com, check out the waiter, uh, waiter2 section there. Uh, there's a GitHub project, there are examples, so uh, if this is something you're interested in, feel free to use it or just copy-paste the code and use it in your project. Yeah, I'm, I intend on adding more stuff there when I have the time, but you know, it's summer, so <laughs> yeah, we'll see. All right, so quite a few things. Uh, thank you for your patience, and uh, if we have any questions, maybe one or two. Oh yeah, already. Hi, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Selenium, but I have to ask because I'm a bigger fan of Playwright right now. What do you think of Playwright? Honestly, I haven't really taken a look at it. Okay. So I know, I know there's always like a debate between three, three libraries. Each of them has their pros, each of them has their cons. I can tell you why I prefer Selenium instead. So to me, Selenium is a complete library that offers basically everything that I need to. I can work with multiple windows, I can work with iframes, you know, everything that I need is there in my project. To me, even, like, even if something really new and shiny comes out on the market, right now I'm not really tempted to move away because I have everything I need here. So unless it's something, you know, that really changes the game, then maybe I will try it out. But in my case, I'm really happy with what I have, so yeah, I'm also a huge fan of Selenium, as you can tell. Any other question? Nope. Hello. 
Okay, so then, uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. And, yeah, okay, hey. all right. Uh, Hello again. Uh, my question is uh, for the element update, the element screenshot part. Uh, do I can, for example, do body screenshot element, take the bigger, bigger, or is uh, there is a restriction on that part? I don't think there is any option for that right now. Okay. Uh, and second, more a bit mean question, uh, Selenium IDE, there is, uh, do you know any information about stabilization of that uh, extension for the browsers? I know that uh, we have a person who is uh, actively working on it, so he is, you know, he's working hard on that, it's like his pet project, so it's ongoing, it's still in development, uh, yeah, I think he's going to release a new version sometime in the future, with all of the changes he's doing, but he is definitely keeping an eye on the feedback and uh, you know everything that comes from people using it. So, stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. So I think it's lunch time, and I think people are really hungry. So uh, go ahead and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much, Karina. Thank you. It's a little thank token you. of appreciation. Thank you very much.